Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about my May wrap up and this will actually be a pretty short video because I did not read too much in the month of May because it was an extremely busy month for me personally. And I guess at the beginning of the video I can just give a little update about what's been happening. I have been away from the channel for a while and it was restorative in terms of taking a little break and focusing on some family things and the things outside of reading which was really Really, really nice but it was also sad because I missed my friends and I am excited to get back to recording and back to talking about the books that I am reading but I'll just talk a little bit about what was going on I started off the month at Disney World with my family so we went there uh, I was actually with a bunch of friends of mine from medical school so we all went with our families and some of those families have kids who are the same age as mine so it was really nice they had some friends to spend time with we went off and did our own thing sometimes my parents came along with us and and it was a really, really fun vacation. Uh, we, you know, did all the usual things. We saw the castle, we ate lots of good snacks, we got matching Encanto t-shirts because we were all big fans of Encanto. Um, and actually, the one of the most exciting things was that Juliet actually pulled the sword out of the stone. So I was both very happy and a little bit sad that that happened because I wanted to pull the sword out of the stone. Not to not to want to steal your nine-year-old daughter's thunder as a you know as a mom, but it was it was a good moment. It was really excited, really exciting. She got lots of claps and she was really happy about it for the rest of the day. So we had lots of fun at Disney. We also popped over to Legoland because Isaac had his birthday while we were there and he is Lego obsessed, so that was a huge day for him and he had such a good time there. So it was really, really fun. Then I came back and I had not read a lot while I was gone because I'm, I vacationed and slept. Like that was all. I ran around after my children doing like thousands and tens of thousands of steps per day. And then when everybody got back to the hotel room, we all fell asleep within minutes. So I had very little time to recharge. Oh, I, I also got to see Alan. So that was super exciting. He was kind enough to drive all the way up to Orlando to see me and we had the best time. He played board games with myself and my husband. They both ganged up on me and were really mean to me. And you know, that was just par for the course when I hang out with either one of them. But it was a really great time and I was very, very happy to see him. Unfortunately, Christina could not make it up with him, but hopefully next time we go down, everybody will be able to get together. When I came back, I had a conference that I needed to attend the weekend after, so I got to go and recharge after the vacation while I stuck Andrew at home alone with the kids. So, you know, he got even more tired and I got rested. So, <laughs> wife of the year in May, but I had a conference with my friends, which was really fun. And then the weekend after that, we had a family getaway with Andrew's family for his mom's birthday. And it was a big uh, milestone birthday, so we had kind of gone and rented a cottage and spent time on the lake, and it was really fun as well that was a big family thing but it meant that in the month of May there was not a ton of time for reading I read five books in the month of May and I liked all of them I really really liked some of them and one of them is definitely a favorite of the year and it was nice like I said to, to take that time to recharge I didn't feel like I had to push myself I didn't feel like I had to force myself to read anything I would have liked to read other things because I like reading and you know I feel sad sometimes when I can't read as much as I would like to during a month but I didn't feel any pressure to keep reading which was an issue that I had been feeling last year all self-imposed obviously but I did not feel that and it's interesting because as I was thinking about it and I was thinking about the channel and what I was going to do when I came back from being away for so long, it made me realize that this is one of the reasons why I have not monetized the channel. And I haven't talked about that before. You definitely get some booktubers or some YouTubers who will talk about like when and how and what happens and how much and all of those things for monetization, which I think is really great. And I am happy for all of my friends who have done that. I This is not meant to be like, this is the, you know, the right way to do things or anything like that. I just know myself as a person and I know the pressure <clears throat> excuse me that I would put on myself if I felt like this was a job because I have been a very goal oriented person I like to do well at my job and I have always been like that since I was young and I think 
if I monetized the channel, I would feel like this was a job and that there was an expectation for there to be a certain number of videos or to cover a certain amount of content or to do certain things and to maintain a speed. And I would, I think I would get into situations where if I wasn't feeling like doing it at the time, I would force myself to do it. And then I would dislike it and I would feel resentful of it. And so that is why I have never monetized the channel or done things like Patreon or any of those things, because I feel like I have built up a community of friends that I really enjoy talking to. We have a great time. We have lots of great discussions. We hang out, we play games, we read books, we discuss, and it's amazing. And I don't have any of that outside pressure, which really works for me. I feel nothing but happiness for all of my friends who are able to maintain those things. And I think they deserve them. I think so many people put so much work into book two because it is a lot of work. Even if it's very casual, I do minimal editing, minimal, like I, I am a very minimalistic person person in terms of approach to this channel. And it still takes time because you have to have the time to record it. You have to have the time to read the books. You have to have the time to do the discussions. All of those things take a lot of time. And the more videos that people are putting out and the more production value that goes into those videos, it's a lot of work. So I'm very happy to see all of my friends out there, you know, getting compensated appropriately for the wonderful work that they do on booktube. I am also very happy that if I need a month to make nothing but a wrap up and a TBR video and only read a couple of books and kind of check out for a little while, I don't feel any internal pressure from doing that. So that was a very long and rambling way for me to say that I was very relaxed during May and I'm excited to come back to booktube and get some videos on the go. But now I'm gonna talk about the books. I will timestamp this so that obviously people can skip through that introductory stuff if they would like to. But like I said, I read five books in the month of May and I had one five-star read, two four-star reads, one three-and-a-half-star read, and one three-star read. Um, I did get to read some of my backlisted books, which has been one of my goals for the year, and I read a couple of works of nonfiction. So I was catching up. My goal for nonfiction had, to, had been to read, I think it was 12 for the year, and I was falling a bit behind in that. So I did catch up on a couple of those this month. The very first book that I read, this one was an audiobook, so I listened to it, was the book Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keefe. So if you have been following my channel for a little while at least, you'll know that one of my favorite books that I read last year was Empire of Pain by this same author. And that was narrative nonfiction that focused on the opiate uh, crisis in mostly in the United States, but just at large, the opiate crisis and how it relates to medicine, which was a topic that I was really interested in both professionally and personally. And I thought that that was phenomenally done. It was an absolute five star read. I blasted through the audiobook. I absolutely, absolutely loved it. And I have wanted to read other things by Radden Keefe. And so I put a hold on some books at the library. And when this one came up, I was super excited to finally pick it up. And it was also excellent. I gave this one four stars just because number one, nonfiction is hard to rate for me. Like I'm used to my own personal set of parameters that I use when I'm rating fiction because I know the things that I like in fiction really well. I'm able to articulate what I like about them, how well I think the author pulled something off for, you know, with regards to my personal taste. And so I feel confident when I give a work of fiction, especially a work of fantasy, a star rating. Nonfiction is trickier because I don't read as much of it. It's certainly something that I've done more in the last few years than years previous. And I just have to, I think, build up an appreciation for when things are done well. Right now, all I can really comment on is if I think the topic is covered fairly, if I feel like this is an unbiased view and we're not getting a lot of personal reflection or personal bias in the storytelling and how compelling I think the read is. So I think that on all counts, this is very, very well done. Say Nothing is the story of conflict and cultural identity in Northern Ireland or in Ireland. And it starts off, so it's, it's kind of a dual point of view. So we start off with a story of a young woman named Jean McConville, I think her name was, um, and she is abducted from her home. And it is 
kind of assumed knowledge or public knowledge that the IRA had something to do with this, but no one feels comfortable speaking out or talking about it or commenting on what happened. And when she is abducted, she has 10 children who are left behind, who are just in this home. I think the oldest of them was 16, maybe at the time that this happened. So the 10 of them are living there and trying to maintain a life and their neighbors and their friends and their family are even scared to go in and help them. And it's it, number one, that story was really heartbreaking. And then kind of interwoven with that really personal narrative is just a history surrounding the conflict and some of the major players in the conflict and how things changed over, I believe like the earliest, like the earliest that the story really digs in into is like the 50s and 60s, I think, but it mostly focuses on the period of time from the 70s up to the early 2000s. And it was really fascinating. Admittedly, this is a part of history that I had only the barest of bones knowledge of. Like I could have told you the names of the parties and maybe some big dates. And certainly I, you know, just from English classes, I have studied poets. So if we go back and we look at poetry from, you know, the 1900s, the 1800s, certainly like some of that is just like bits of like cultural tidbits, I guess, that have infiltrated in into my mind. But to know the details of what actually happened and to follow the cultural shifts and the societal shifts and how that impacted people, I didn't have a great idea of what really was going on or what had happened. And this book was excellent for somebody who, who went in for like, like I said, only the barest of understandings of what had happened what had happened and it, it was really really good it was hard to read at times and it was thought-provoking I think that Radden Keefe just like in Empire of Pain when there's clearly like an Empire of Pain there's clearly a, a bad guy like there are people who are withholding medical information who are selling things to people knowing full well what they are doing and what they are creating and what impact they're having on society. In this book, he takes a much more zoomed out lens and kind of presents both sides of the conflict, how things arose without imposing any moral judgments on anyone from either side, but being very frank about the harm that certain things did to members of the community, about how people's lives changed, about it's it's just really, really well done. Patrick Radden Keefe has become one of my favorite nonfiction authors. And like I said, I haven't read that much nonfiction, so it's not like I can I don't feel confident being like this, he will be the best for everyone because I haven't read enough to say that. But if you are interested in getting into nonfiction and you want books that are going to really pull you in and be really compelling, the two books that I have read by him so far have been phenomenal and I will absolutely read his others as soon as I can. I think there might be four. I know there's at least one more, but I will look it up and see and hopefully might be able to squeeze in another of his books before the end of the year. After that, I read An Alchemy of Masks and Mirrors. Uh, I did a conversation, a spoiler chat with Alan and Anita about that book, and we had a great time discussing it. This is a steampunk fantasy where we follow a young woman and her guardian, basically. So he is a knight, um, like kind of like a musketeer. He's the king's musketeer, and he is sent to protect her from the time that she is born. And at the time that the story opens up, she is being married off into another kingdom. And so she has to go and meet the ruler of this kingdom. They have to establish their relationship. Her musketeer is going to go along with her to make sure that she is protected. And once she arrives there, things start to unravel that will impact the health of her birth nation, of her new nation, and just kind of like the wider world at large. There's some really cool clockwork stuff that happens. There's the steampunky kind of like airship element. The magic that they use in this story is really cool. There is um, shadow magic where some magic users can kind of manipulate shadows and manipulate people's souls. There is mirror magic where you can step into a mirror and then travel from place to place. But when you are in this mirror state, you, you interact and function a little bit differently than you do in the real world. And then there are also some other magical elements that are more fun to discover by reading the book. So just take my word for it that they're really fun and it, it's nice to see them all unfold. I really like this one. It was not a five star read. So I think I gave this one three and a half stars. I did. So it was fun, but I was hoping and I think this was just my own expectations that I had set up before I went in. I was hoping for something like a little more great coatsy. 
I wanted more of the swashbuckling and it was more of like a methodical tale because we're we're doing the kind of mystery solving element and we're looking at the magic and there is there is swashbuckling adventure it's just in pieces and because this is a dual pov between our main female character and our and our male character we do swap stories back and forth so we're following different parts at different times that being said the narrative voices are very distinctive the characters were very easy to root for the kind of father daughter the musketeer is not this woman's father but he is certainly a father figure and the father daughter type relationship in this book is one of the absolute best ones that i have ever read it was never condescending or patronizing he cared for her and his care for her came through as trust for her to make her own decisions and to be able to live her own life. And he trusted that she could make the right choices, which doesn't often happen in fantasy, in fiction, or in life. Often those kinds of relationships can be a lot more, <sighs> It can kind of place the woman in a role where they feel like they need to be protected, where they are this damsel or this person that requires your input or your direction. And really, this was just about him letting her grow and find her own path and work toward her own life, which was so refreshing and so delightful. I will certainly be continuing on with this series and hopefully be able to discuss the next one with Alan and Anita. And I have heard or people had kind of said when we were having that conversation that the second one is even better than the first. And I am looking forward to reading it. After that was another one of my nonfictions. So this was another one I have put on hold at the library. And that is The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. So this is a memoir by Joan Didion about grief after the loss of her husband. And it follows her life and follows her reaction to his passing for a year. So how she felt, what she went through. And what she talks about basically is that there was not a lot of good accessible information about grief because death and grief and loss is something that in Western society we have pushed to the side and made almost taboo. It's not something that people want to talk about. It's something that feels shameful to to talk about or to show. To She talks about how her emotions were very difficult, <clears throat> excuse me, to present because it almost felt like she was breaking some sort of rule to show how sad she was or how heartbroken she was. The writing here was beautiful. This was also an audiobook and it was gorgeous. It was so lovely to listen to. And I, I think that it had a lot of really thoughtful things to say about grief and about the way that we approach death. And she talks about this magical thinking, which is something that does happen in patients who suffer from anxiety, where you will make bargains with yourself or the universe. You know, if I don't knock this over, then I will not like X will not happen. Or, you know, thinking that if I, you know, if I think about this thing, then it might come to pass. And she talks about how some of that was interwoven into guilt and how she would kind of bargain or if she if she didn't admit out loud that he was gone, then he had not yet died. And it was really poetic and heartfelt and it was tough to listen to. It was really sad, but I think that it would be very helpful for anyone who has gone through um, grief, grieving a family member or a, you know, a loved one themselves. And it's nice to have books like that that are available because as she points out, there is, it is very difficult to find books that handle that topic and do it well. So I was glad that I read that one. That one was a short one, but I think that it was very much worth reading. After that, I read a romance. So this was one that was a new release for this year called Bitter Medicine. And I didn't write down the author's name, but I will pop the picture up so that we can we can see what the author's name is. But it's a new release and was kind of like a mashup of um, fantasy and romance. So it had a lot of fantasy elements and it was very the fantasy parts were really really interesting very very cool and then we had our romance elements so what we have is our two main characters who by the time we get into the story they already know each other and have already established a very um affectionate relationship they are not in a romantic relationship but it is very clear when you step into the story that they both have feelings for each other we have one who works in for a mysterious agency and we know from following his perspective that he is kind of like an enforcer he has to go out and fight people or hurt people or fix things and has to do whatever his boss tells him and his boss is really not a nice person and he is a half elf i believe 
And so he has magical powers that come along with that. And then our other main character is a young woman who is working her job at the beginning of the book is tattooing people and her tattoos can imbue them with strength or with other magical abilities and her past is a little bit um, more mysterious so we don't find out everything about her past from the very beginning but we know that she has had some sort of family uh, struggle some family drama and it has impacted her life in a great way she is also she comes from a magical healing family and so she is descendant from a god of medicine and she has a very important role within her family. And so we watch these two characters as their jobs bring them in kind of closer proximity. And our main male character is given a job that kind of ties directly into her past family drama. So as he tries to carry this job out, he starts to realize that she's actually entwined with this person that he's trying to hunt down. So he's trying to figure out what has happened. She's trying to protect her family and protect her past and protect her secrets. And that obviously causes a wedge in this relationship that they have. I will say I gave this one three stars. So this was my lowest rated book of the month. And I'm sad because I really thought that this was going to be a five star read for me. And it purely has to do with the romance elements. The fantasy stuff in this book I thought was so cool. I would have much rather read a book that was entirely fantasy based on this premise and the characters and the magic and the plot. But because the romance was interwoven, that played a huge role in the story. And it's just not the kind of romance that I like. The kind of romance that I like to follow is the you know, this relationship is just beginning. They're either just meeting, there's some sort of conflict that they need to resolve. It felt like a lot of the romantic tension that I look for in a romance novel was already gone by the time that the book started because it was already established that they both really liked each other. And even though the job was getting in the way of that, it was very clear that they had feelings for each other. They, you know, it was a very mature relationship. They talked about a lot of things. These are the problems. These are my fears. And it just lacked a lot of that romantic tension that I look for. However, if you were someone who enjoys more of a friends to lovers type of romance where there is already this really strong foundation, this bedrock of care um, between the two characters and you like fantasy elements woven in, I think this could be a really big hit for a lot of people who enjoy fantasy romance. So I would certainly recommend it. It's just that if you enjoy more of the kind of getting to know you early stages of a relationship, I'm more of like a slow burn kind of person. I wanna see that relationship build really slowly and then have a big payoff at the end. Um, so it was just really not to my personal taste, but I'm still glad that I read it. I would read other things by this author because I really like the style. I loved the fantasy elements that were incorporated. It was just that this particular relationship scenario was not my romance taste, that's all. And then the last book that I read for the month, it's my favorite book that I read for the month and one of my favorite books that I have read this year, and that is Project Hail Mary. I have had this book, this audiobook, in my Audible account for a year without reading it, and I'm so angry at myself now because now that I have listened to it, this has to be, I'm going to make a bold statement. I think this is the best audiobook that I have ever listened to in my life. And there are some great audiobooks. Like, there are some that I have loved, but this one, it's number one, it's perfect for audio because some of the the way that information is communicated just works really well in that kind of narration form. For anybody who hasn't heard, I'm just like going barreling ahead of myself. For anyone who's never heard of Project Hail Mary, you only need to know the barest of bones. So this is a book where a man wakes up on a spaceship and has no idea why. And so we follow him in two timelines. Number one, as he is on this spaceship, trying to figure out what to do, how things work, where he is, is there anybody else there? Where is he going? And then the past timeline where we get piece by little piece who this person was. And he doesn't even remember his name at the beginning of the book. So who is he? What was his life? What brought him to this point? And the threads come together over the course of the novel. And it is so good. I can understand. I think it was last year that everybody, everybody had this on, or maybe it was the year before, I don't remember, but everybody had this on their best of the year list. And I absolutely understand why it is phenomenal. I can see because when I was reading it, there were a couple people or at least one person in Discord who didn't have the same reaction um, to the book. 
And I think if you were reading it, there are some parts and some dialogue and some word choices, especially that I feel like work so much better as audio than they would if you were reading it. And I think like, don't get me wrong. I think I still would have loved this book if I read it with my eyeballs, but listening to it was delightful. It was like, I went to Disney World last month and I think listening to Project Hail Mary was the most fun that I had in the entire month. It was so, so, so good. I loved it from start to finish. I would make things up so that I would have be able to go and listen to it. I was reading to, reading other books that were really good that I had to throw to the side because I was like, nope, it, it cannot compare. So I am so, so, so happy that I listened to this. And then someone told me afterwards that it's been gonna become a movie, I think, is it a movie or a show? I don't remember, but it's being adapted anyway. So that's really exciting. I think it would be a fun one to watch and hopefully they do a good job with it. But I am very, very happy that I put this on my 23 books to read in 2023 list and that I finally got around to reading it. I am definitely going to convince Andrew to read it. The only problem is he doesn't really do audio, so maybe I will get a physical copy and get him to read it because I think that he will really like the science things that are in this book. I think that he would really enjoy it, but I love it. For anybody else who has loved Project Hail Mary, I am now one of you. This book was fantastic and I'm super excited to see anything else that comes out that is related to it. But that's it. Like I said, not a ton of books read in May, but I feel restored. I am excited to tackle my giant June TBR and I will see all of you with another video soon. Bye.